My name is Armando Rodriguez. Information of little to no consequence, of course unless you want to look up my book in Amazon. In this video I will be discussing a problem in electrostatics that will be stressing two important concepts. These I use time and again in physics. They are uniqueness. That's when it is known that only one solution exists. Then it can be used as a method for finding that solution and the superposition principle to which you might have already been acquainted with. This problem will have two parts. A. Obtain the expression for the potential of a solid metal insulated sphere of radius r that is originally neutral when a point charge q is brought at a distance d from its center. And B. Evaluate the obtained expression for r equal 1 meter, d equal 3 meters, and q equal 1 coulomb. Before making any attempt to jump into solving this, ask yourself if all the information needed has been provided. Don't think that for this being a teaching problem you can take that for granted. Maybe you're supposed to come up with some assumptions of your own, right? For example, in this one, nothing has been said about a stationary state, and the word electrostatic has not even been mentioned, right? However, this can be safely assumed, since the expression for the potential has been requested, and from this it can be inferred that the sphere is already equipotential, which only happens after every transient process has ended. Is all the information given uh, relevant? Well, uh, the information of it being a conducting sphere, its radius, the charge, the distance, all this seems relevant. How about it being insulated? That's important too since it is telling us that the sphere must remain neutral. Had it somehow been connected to something, then it might have exchanged some charge with that something when the point charge Q was brought to its nearness, right? What about it being solid and not hollow? Well, that one is superfluous. After a steady state is reached, no field can exist inside a conducting object. So it makes no difference if the sphere is solid or if it's just a shell. How can we tackle this problem? The Laplacian of V, a function of the position vector R, equals the volumetric charge density the singularity of which is represented by a Dirac delta on vector d, subject to a boundary condition of being known to be constant on a locus satisfying that the modulus of the position vector equals the sphere radius r, which is a typical Dirichlet boundary value problem, right? What? Just kidding. However, something that we know has been proven for that kind of boundary value problem is the uniqueness of its solutions, meaning that if we happen to guess a solution, then that's the one and not any other. One example of solution guessing was that of the mirror method, also known as the method of images. It worked very well for the case of the point charge in front of an infinite conducting plane. It also worked for the case of a point charge and a grounded sphere. In case you need to know why this is so, there's a Feynman style elementary proof at the end. Let's put this into words. The ratio of the negative image over the original charge equals the ratio of the sphere radius over the distance and the distance of the image to the center over the radius equals the same ratio. 
However, in this case, the sphere did not stay neutral. For building up the image to the intruder charge Q, it took some charge from its ground connection. But there's no such connection in the problem at hand, so the total charge in the sphere must remain equal to zero. Is it that the image method does not apply here? I went back to Laplace and there is left. Wow. Relax. Maybe we can do some more guessing. Maybe there's a way of neutralizing the image charge and still keep this fairy key potential, right? What about adding a similar point charge at the center? Well, with the opposite sign, of course. Like this. Huh. Good guess. That's a solution. And so it is the solution. Based on the superposition principle, we can express the potential at the surface of the sphere as the sum of the original charge in its image plus the neutralizing charge at the center. This expression. Now bring back from your short-term memory storage what you've learned from the grounded sphere case. There we go. The image charge is a fraction of the original Q given by the radius to distance ratio. Replacing the lowercase Q in the expression for the potential, we get Simplifying, and that's a requested expression for the potential of the sphere. There was a second part to the problem. The obtained expression had to be evaluated for the following data. Radius of the sphere, one meter. Pretty big for a solid metal ball, right? The distance was 3 meters, quite some space. And the charge was one colon, on, uh, just one. Hmm. The expression just found, making the substitutions. Oops, we need to Google epsilon zero. Back from Google. And the calculation renders. What? Three billion balls? Billions with a B? There must be something wrong here. Nope. One Coulomb is a lot of charge. There's something that's also worth pointing out. According to the obtained expression, the potential is not dependent on the radius of this sphere. Hmm. Meaning that uh, the radius was also superfluous. Yeah, <laughs> but w there was no way of knowing that before finding the solution, right? For those of you that absolutely need to know where the expression of the position and charge of the image in the case of the grounded sphere came from, I present you Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman. He will be explaining his concept of what an elementary demonstration is. Just listen. I am going to give what I will call an elementary demonstration. By elementary does not mean easy to understand. <laughs> elementary means that nothing, very little, is required to know ahead of time in order to understand it, except to have an infinite amount of intelligence. <laughs> the, there may be a large number of steps that are very hard to follow, but each step does not require already knowing calculus, already knowing Fourier transforms, and so on. Yeah. 
Did he say infinite intelligence? In this case, we're not going to be needing analytic geometry, not even trigonometry. Let's start by finding the expression of the potential at point P1. This one lies on the symmetry axis nearest to the intruder charge Q. The potential there is the sum of the contribution of charge Q and its image, which must be equal to zero. Now let's consider another point P2 that also lies on the axis this time farthest from Q. The potential there has the same two contributions and must be equal to zero also. Zero in the potential for P1 and P2 render a system of two equations with the two unknowns, D prime and lowercase q. Having infinite intelligence allows the manipulation of these expressions in a way that gets to a solution in just a few steps. Let's begin with the obvious. What's in parentheses must be equal to zero. So, uh, let's start isolating the quotients. I like them better on the, on the right side. There. Now let's factor the R in the numerator and the D in the denominator. Here a guess may save a lot of algebra. Let's try this. This allows a lot of canceling. And we get... Good! This satisfies the system. Eureka! Stop, 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 hold that applause. This just proves that the potential is zero for the two points on the axis. What happens with the rest? For that, we need to express the potential of an arbitrary point P off the axis of symmetry. Since the potential must be zero, what's inside the parenthesis must also be zero. So we get that for attaining potential zero at P, the quotients of the charges must be inverse to their distances to P. Consider now triangle OPQ. And now triangle OP lowercase q. They seem as similar, right? The colors showing the possible corresponding sides. But for what we learned from P1 and P2 on the axis, this was true. So, the two sides of those triangles have the same proportion. Since the angle of those two sides is one and the same, The triangle is guilty as charged, meaning that B and A must share the same proportion too. But so does the image and the intruder charges. Finally, we get to enjoy that applause. 